Mr. Fee, we are actually, I hope this is okay with you. If it's not, this is your moment to speak up. Um, videoing this for Facebook Live and for our own YouTube channel. So you can share it to your own Facebook page or whatever and have bragging rights and everyone will hate you that you were here tonight and they weren't, right? Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to mention it so you won't say anything you don't want to live on the web forever. <laughs> I assume it's all on the web at this point. If you do a public appearance, there's always someone there with the phone. Right. You know? And I always think, what if I got really nervous and, like, I don't know, crop my pants or something like that? <laughs> Please don't. And, like, the thing is, so the thing is, is on the one hand, it would be terrible because millions of people would watch it and, like, laugh at me. I'd be like, I'd be the writer who cropped his pants on stage, in, you know, in front of, like, 100 people. On the other hand, There'd be so much, such an outpouring of pity for me. I have to believe it would move. A book or I have to believe it would move a lot of books. <laughs> you have to, in this business, you have to stay attuned to any opportunity, you know, to move some, to move some copies. So, so I promised uh, several people that I would ask. Uh, Joe, some of the dumb questions that you're too embarrassed to ask, so that'll be my <laughs> So before we sort of launch into things, um, a couple of things. One is, this is um, our first official announcement of a wonderful series published by the Poison Pen Press called The Haunted Library. Um, I am uh, the co-general editor of that series. It's published uh, by the Horror Writers Association in conjunction with Poison Pen Press. Uh, it's classics of the horror genre in um, what I guess I've described as mass market trade paperbacks, it aimed at the general reader uh, with discussion questions, lightly annotated, I've tried to restrain myself, um, and uh, an introduction by celebrity uh, writers in the genre. The first book is Phantom of the Opera, uh, with an introduction by Nancy Holder. The second is The Beetle. Uh, with an introduction by Chelsea Quinn Yarborough, and the third is Vatek, uh, with an introduction by Joe Lansdale. Um, and I've, yes, I've already asked Joe if he'll do an introduction for one of these guys. <laughs> um, these are to try and instill people um, a, a, in a discovery um, of the classics. Um, modern horror, modern thrilling literature is not uh, something that we invented. It's based on these building blocks of these classics. And uh, Barbara and the Poison Myth Press has had a wonderful success of publishing the classics of the British Library. Um, and so this seemed to me to be a natural thing for them to add. First, non-mystery titles you'll ever publish. But, uh, and the only. So you saw a little brochure about that on your seats. Uh, the books will come out in January, and uh, we hope you will enjoy them and spread the word about horror classics. I mean, where would we be without, you know, um, M.R. James, H.G. Wells, Mary Shelley. I figured by the time they had completed their works, there were no original ideas left to explore in fantasy and horror. We've just been recycling ever since. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't, I don't think that's really true, but I think that there's certainly <clears throat> deep inspiration. I, I, one of the things that I, um, I should plug, I guess, uh, the book that we have on sale tonight, which is... Uh, the new annotated H.P. Lovecraft, Beyond Arkham. It's the second volume of my annotated H.P. Lovecraft. Came out two weeks ago. Um, so Lovecraft is an example. Lovecraft is one of those authors where, you know, when you talk to uh, Clive Barker, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, Peter Straub, they all say, yes, we loved Lovecraft, we were inspired by Lovecraft, you know, and we drew things from them. Um, and so that's the way it is with these classics. Yeah. Now, what about you? What about influences well, on your writing? Well, you know, so so my very first novel uh, was a novel called Heart Shaped Box, and it's about a, a kind of, um, it's about this burned out heavy metal, metal musician in his sixties. His stage name is Judas Coin, and uh, he's got a whole collection of grotesque artifacts. Um, he's got a tray pan, which is uh, he's got a tray pan human skull. He's got a witch's confession from the 17th century. He's got an actual snuff film. And he hears about a woman selling a ghost online, and he decides to add that to his collection. And if you've seen even one horror film, you know what a terrible idea this is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and 
Um, Jude winds up spending the next 300 pages regretting that choice. But you know, you're talking about the building blocks of horror. Um, the the ghost comes attached to a suit, um, a, a, an old fashioned black suit. And um, I the when I if you squint your eyes and look at the book very closely, you can see an M. R. James story called Casting the Runes, which was later made into a um, a, a film in the 1950s called Curse of the Demon, which is both chilling and sort of hilarious. It's hilarious because it's got this demon, occasionally you see the demon, and it's this like miniature, this like, you know, foggy, out of focus miniature of this thing going, yeah. <laughs> and it's like so not scary, you know, that, that you kind of fall off the couch laughing at it. But as long as you don't see the demon, and all the stuff where you don't see the demon, just where the demon is coming for this guy, that's scary, effectively scary, and of course the short story it was based on is a classic. Um, in in uh, Curse of the Demon and Casting the Runes, um, when you come in possession of this slip of paper that has some runes on it, um, you only have about seven days to live um, before the demon catches up to you. And essentially, in Heart Shaped Box, the suit serves the same purpose as the runes in the M.R. James story. And you know, now that I'm saying it out loud, isn't this actually <coughs> also the plot of um, the rain? The rain. Yeah, I wonder if I wonder if uh, um, I wonder if the ring was consciously or unconsciously developed from the same concept. They're not, as you said, there's there aren't any original ideas. But it is true. But it is true. I mean, well, that's what Jung would say. They're 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 deep down. They're stories that are meaningful to us because of because we're human beings. Right. I mean, there are, there are, you know, there are um, archetypes yeah. that you can play with and employ to new uses, you know, to fresh original uses, but the archetype itself has been around for a long time. I mean, you know, uh, my second novel, Horns, is about a guy who goes out on a big bender one night um, and gets drunk. He's been, this, this guy, Ig Parrish, um, is generally believed to have killed his girlfriend even though there isn't enough evidence to convict him of it. But he's been definitely convicted in the court of public opinion. And he goes out one night, and he gets drunk, and he curses God. And when he wakes up the next morning, he discovers he's growing a pair of horns. And with those horns, I've actually had a couple hangovers like this, so it was based on <laughs> close personal experience. But, but, um, with the, he didn't wake up like a cop. Well, so, so, that's where I was going. It is, it is of course, it is, of course, a riff on Kafka. It wasn't even my first riff on Kafka. I mean, I had actually done another story in 20th Century Ghosts called You Will Hear the Locust Sing. And that one, so I was, okay, so, so I was in Florida and I was visiting with my folks and I, I went out for a bike ride or like, and I was wearing sandals like an idiot. And I, and I, I put my foot down in an ant hill, a hill of biting red ants and suddenly it was like my foot was on fire. And at the time, I was actually reading Metamorphosis by Kafka. And you know, in Metamorphosis, Gregor Samson turns into uh, this cockroach, and then for the rest of the story, mopes around and feels bad for himself in his bedroom before dying. I mean, that's really all he does is he has a, he has a feel bad that lasts for two months, and he dies. And like, I'm getting chewed on by these red ants, and I'm thinking, you know, most insects actually have a lot more fight in them. Um, and so I, I wrote a story called You Will Hear the Locust Sing about uh, a young kid, high school age kid who's been rejected by all his friends and he lives on the edge. He's, it's like sort of the 1950s and he lives downwind of the nuclear test experiments, um, which I'm pretty sure they did like about 10 miles from here. Um, <laughs> and uh, one morning he wakes up and he's become a giant locust. And uh, the thing is, is it's, he actually prefers it to being human. It's actually like, he's like, finally, I'm, I am what I would like to be. Um, and he runs around, you know, chopping people's heads off with his mandibles. Because I can, basically. <laughs> so, um, I, I wanted to talk about some of your other stuff. Uh, it's, uh, th there's a wonderful story that Neil Gaiman tells about going to a cocktail party and being introduced to somebody as a comic book writer. And then the, the guy wanders off and he comes back an hour later and said, 
You didn't tell me you wrote graphic novels. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been doing that too, right? Is it, what, what was this? What came first? Short stories, novels, comics? Comics. Comics. I was a comic book writer before I was a novelist. You know, um, I. Uh, uh, it's all kind of so. So I was. I, I've always had a comic book imagination, and um, you know, uh, to this day in Bangor, Maine. There are 14 long boxes of bagged and boarded comics. That's the comic collection my brother and I share. None of those comics are ever looked at or read or enjoyed in any way whatsoever because, because every time we've tried to divvy up the, the collection, we begin to argue about who bought what. <laughs> and so we're in a stalemate where neither of us can actually touch the collection. But in any event, so, so I've, always, I've always loved comic books. And when I was in, when I was in college, as I knew I wanted to be a writer. But I'm, I'm a pretty insecure guy, and and I, I felt it would be dangerous to try to write as Joseph King. Um, you know, both my parents are well-regarded writers, you know. Um, um, what are you again? You're <laughs> 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 the, um, yeah, the, um, you know, you know I, I didn't, I, I had this fear that I would write a really lousy novel, and then, and then someone would decide to publish it anyway, because they saw a chance to make a quick buck, off a famous last name, and uh, and I believed I couldn't bear that idea. I, I believed and still believe that readers are basically pretty smart, and they might buy one book because you got a famous daddy, but if the book's no good, they won't buy the second one. And I was selfish enough to want a long career, you know. So I dropped the last name and I started writing as Joe Hill, and I was able to keep it under wraps for about 10 years. And my secret to staying anonymous, um, he's, he's impressed, but I'm gonna tell him, I'm gonna tell, tell, tell you guys what this, my secret was to keeping it undercover. Failure. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how easy it is to remain anonymous when you can't get published. Um, um, I, wrote, I wrote four novels that I was never able to sell. Uh, there was one called The Fear Tree that I spent three years on and still feel had a lot of good elements uh, to it, but it was turned down by every publisher in New York City. It was turned down, uh, it was shanked by every publisher in London. Um, for a final degrading kick in the nuts, it was turned down by every publisher in Canada. <laughs> which, which goes to show that no matter how low you draw, there's always another step down. Uh, um, and so, so, uh, so I actually got to a point where I thought maybe I didn't have a novel in me. Um, however, at the same, during the same period, I started writing short stories. And, um, and those short stories, some of them began to sell to good markets, and some of them won literary prizes or got in best of collections. One of those stories, 20th Century Ghost, was in a best of collection, which was then read by a talent scout at Marvel Comics. Um, at the time, Marvel had a sort of under the radar program to find new writers. So they were grabbing writer, playwrights and poets short story writers and pulling them in. And um, they had two titles, uh, Spider-Man Unlimited and X-Men Unlimited, which were their tryout titles, even though they weren't advertised that way. And I got to write an 11-page Spider-Man story for Spider-Man Unlimited, and that was my big breakthrough. Not the sale of a novel, not, it was for me, that was the big time. And in a way, it kind of made sense. I mean, I went through this whole stage of trying to write New Yorker stories. You know, uh, stuff like John Cheever, and right. but none of those stories never really worked. So I didn't like New Yorker stories. <laughs> and New Yorker stories were boring. I mean, I was like, when I was like, you know, in my 20s, I was reading fucked up horror comics by <laughs> Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore, and you know, and so for me, the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and so for me, getting to write Spider Man, even though I didn't do a terribly good job with it. I mean, in some ways, that my that 11-page Spider-Man story is my worst published piece. Um, it's somewhat saved by the art of the, the you know, incredible artist I worked with, Seth, Seth Fisher, uh, who passed away not long afterward. Terrible. Um, but, but, you know, that for me was, was a sort of electrifying breakthrough. Eventually, I did sell a book, 20th Century Ghost, a collection of stories to a small press in England. Not long afterwards, I wrote Heart Shaped Box um, and was able to sell that. But even before Heart Shaped Box was 
was uh, published, you know, I was I was deep into a comic book called Lock and Key, which I wound up writing for the next seven years. So thank you. Graphic novel. Yeah, that, that one. That one put. I'll tell you what. Lock and Key puts the graphic back in graphic novel. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> it's, that, it's one of those books. It just it, it just would be completely different as a novel. Well, well, and some people have asked, like, well, you know, why do you why do you decide to do you know, um, one thing is a comic book instead of a novel. But in the case of Lock and Key, you know, um, it always was a comic book. It was actually, so I, I sold that Spider-Man story and then I was eager to do more comics and I pitched Marvel on a bunch of comics. One of the comics I pitched him on was Baby Hulk. So, because I had, because I had like this, I had a toddler then, and, and I, I, I was shocked at how angry they are. Like, like little, little toddlers are so, they're not like in the TV shows at all. You know, like my toddler was always pissed off about stuff, and he'd, you know, he'd like pick up a plastic truck and he'd be like, and throw it across the room. And I'd think, what if that was a real truck? You know? And so I, I pissed Marvel on Baby Hulk for some reason they passed. <laughs> I also pitched him on, on, a, on a haunted house story. It was a story about a house full of enchanted magical keys. Every key unlocks a different door and activates a different supernatural power. And they passed on that too. Of course, oh, that's <laughs> ridiculous. Um, you know, so, sell action figures. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and several other people had a SWAT at Lock and Key, had a look at Lock and Key and passed on it. Um, um, eventually, it wound up at IDW um, through a sort of secure, circuitous backdoor route. Um, IDW was publishing a horror comic called Doom that was sort of like heavy metal, sort of like Tales from the Crypt a little bit. It was an anthology series, and they were snapping up short stories by young writers because they could get them cheap. And uh, they, good. yeah, it does sound like Ted Adams, doesn't it? No, no, <laughs> no, Ted's the best. But the um, Ted Adams, yeah, right, 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 the time. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so they had picked up a couple stories from Cory Doctorow. They had a copy of Twentieth Century Ghosts, and and they were interested in adapting a couple stories from that. Chris Ryle, the, the editor in chief at, at IDW, asked me if they could license them to do them for Doom, and I said, No, wait, I've got something better. And I picked them the plot of Lock and Key. And I told them I could tell the whole story in six issues, and they bought it. Um, and, and, and well, well, I, I, I didn't think it was possible to tell in six issues until I started writing it. I was only off, in my defense, I was only off by 31. <laughs> and a lot of years. Yeah, and about six years. And about six years. So now you are a publisher. Uh, tell us a little well, bit. Well, weirdly, yeah. Uh, and that's also a comic book thing. So... So um, I got a new. I, I was I was approached a couple years ago uh, by DC Comics by an editor there um, about doing some comics for them, and I pitched them on an idea. You know, we're like in this golden age of horror. You know, this is unbelievable. If you're a horror fan, it's an unbelievably great moment. Um, yeah, totally. You know, there's been so many good films. You know, it seems like like when I was a kid, a film like The Exorcist would come along every five years and raise the bar. Nowadays, it seems like we have a film that, on that level every five months. You know, we have pictures like Get Out and Hereditary and It Follows. We have TV shows like Stranger Things and Mindhunters, which is horror, as, I'm, you know, Haunting a Hill House. I mean, I, I thought Haunting a Hill House incredibly elevated the genre. It took it places it's never been before. And, and I don't want comics to miss out on the action. So I, I, when I was talking to DC, I pitched him on this idea, and the idea was basically Blumhouse for comics. So the way Blumhouse has worked is they've done like five horror films a year, and they've just created this absolute industry of classy, intelligent, really scary horror films going from you know, uh, Paranormal Activity, The Conjuring, uh, Sinister, Oculus, Whiplash, which is like their scariest film ever, you know, turned high school music, college music teachers really are terrifying. Um, you know, and, and so I pitched them, I pitched them on doing uh, Blumhouse for Comics, which we creatively wound up naming Hill House Comics. Um, and, and we've got um, the first title drops at the end of the month, and it's one that I'm writing. It's, called, it's got the very tasteful title of Basket Full of Heads. 
<laughs> and uh, and it's real gonzo. I, I love that. I've had so much fun writing it. But so that comes out October 30th. Um, I'm doing two others for him. I'm doing one called Plunge, um, which is kind of a riff on John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, I'm doing another one that's a backup feature that's going to run in every single one of these comics. It's called Sea Dogs, and it's about how we won the Revolutionary War with werewolves. <laughs> and, then, and then I've also got, I'm working with some of the, you know, some incredible talents on, on a set of other titles. So Carmen Maria Machado, who wrote one, she was nominated for a National Book Award for her collection, Her Body and Other Parties. She's doing her first comic. It's called The Lolo Woods. And it's a creep fest set in the town of Shudder to Think, Pennsylvania. Um, that one is great. I'm working with M.R. Carey, who wrote The Girl with All the Gifts. And he's, he's, he's an old comics pro. He worked on uh, Lucifer with Peter Gross, and he did a great comic called Unwritten. He's doing one called The Dollhouse Family, which is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the Indian in the cupboard, if the cupboard was actually a gateway to hell. Uh, and uh, uh, and so that's cool. And then um, there, there, there's uh, you know uh, um, one of the great artists of horror, Kelly Jones, is working with an amazing screenwriter, uh, Laura Marks, on a, a comic called Daphne Byrne. And that one is kind of a ghost and gaslight thing. It's set in the 19th century and plays a little like a feminist omen. Um, and so all these are rolling out over the next four or five months. And that's the first wave. And we plan to keep it going as long as people want to buy them. This is, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the chair of the graphic novel jury for the horror writers uh, for the Stoker Awards. I've already, I've already I, said they'll get a scolding from you if I they see. don't get to see the comics. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, five bucks would be appreciated. But, um, <laughs> and, you know, the, is that really, I, that's really the going rate for bribery for you? Is it five? <laughs> you know, it's tough what? to nonfiction <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, what I was going to say is um, that the submissions for the last couple of years from places like Boom, Image, mm -hmm. there, there is magnificent work being done. Yeah, They're well, Image fabulous. Yeah, Image does amazing, amazing books. They're all creator own books, and yeah. you know they've done some tremendous. They're stuff. just great, and they're, you know they're not being marketed really as uh, horror or in that particular. So we're going to segue on this, uh, and you know um, Hill House is, doesn't say horror. Maybe it yeah. implies horror, but yeah. so let's talk about the state of the industry. And, uh, and yes, where's Jillian, my, where's and, my wife? Yeah, she's Jillian got a copy. She's like, and, Jillian, yeah, do, you have, does. Jillian <laughs> do you have a copy of the, the can I? Okay, the cover the, says I should show horror, you the, the issue. Does. I should show you the cover of Basket yeah. Full of Heads. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's gone. I'm going to go and sit in that chair. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the pictures, the words don't say horror. That's what I was trying to say. I mean, I mean it's not exactly a funny animal's book. So, that's, so well, the, the point I was going to get to is one that uh, uh, we, we've already had some conversation about, which is, you know, sort of the H word in publishing and how difficult it is to sell both to the publisher and then for the publisher to sell horror. Right. Um, and, I mean, do you feel, are you suffering from that at all? I mean, no, I mean, I do think, so, so, um, first of all, I don't think that you should be ashamed of saying, I write horror or I read horror. It's a wonderful genre doing some of the most exciting work uh, in, you know, in any branch of the arts um, right now. Um, you know, and like when I was a kid, I used to read Fangoria Magazine. Does anyone what? know that? Yeah. Fangoria Magazine was dedicated, it was a magazine dedicated to the art of gross out special effects and artists like Rick Baker and Rob Botten and Tom Savini and Stan Winston. It was like Playboy, it had centerfolds, um, but not like Playboy. This was like, you know, like the centerfolds of Playboy are always like, you know. Nude girls and stuff. Yeah, nude girls. Body parts you know, and yeah, and yeah. like Fangori was always like some, you know, gork with an axe in his head and one eyeball <laughs> popping out and stuff. And, you know, I had my walls covered with those. Um, um, it used to make me crazy reading. So Fango would cover all the horror films that were coming out. It used to make me crazy when you'd have some director saying, you know, I don't really think of myself as a horror director. 
and he's like directing Sleepaway Camp Massacre 6. And I'm like, I'm like, you're not fucking Fellini either. No <laughs> 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 offense. Um, um, but I do think, I do think, you know, in the 80s, in the 1980s, there were, you know, bookstores had a horror section, and the, they had to be really, you know, the books were always titled things like Entrails, and the covers would sort of like had. They're like textures on them, like there'd be like a gross rotting skull with like a maggot coming out of the eyeball. You could actually sort of feel it if you, yeah. you know, and and the cover would have like a lot of foil on it and like glitter and stuff. And the thing is, it's like most of those books sucked. <laughs> and the bottom fell out of the market because readers just felt like, why are we spending our money on this garbage? It's garbage. Um, and so now I think, you know, when you look for horror, you look for it in the literature section. Um, someone asked me not too long ago, you know, do you wish, do, do, do you hate that the horror genre doesn't exist in bookstores anymore? Don't you wish it would come back? And I always think, no. You know, because, like, I want my books in the, in the literature section, in the fiction, general fiction section, because I don't want to exist in a section that's only visited by 10% of the foot traffic in a bookstore. You know, because, like, the horror section is like, in a bookstore is like, you know, a few dudes would walk over and be like, yeah, I really like this, because I really like books called Entrails. <laughs> but like a lot of readers are like, no, I don't like horror. That's not my kind of thing. You know, I'd, I'd rather read, you know, um, I'd rather read uh, something that's not at all like horror, like, you know, and then, you know, and then pick up a book of ghost stories. I mean, I'm trying to think, well, like, what's a good example of like literary horror, hmm. you know, that's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're talking about old ones. So. Yeah, well, that yeah, was really like, like an old like Paul Trembley. Cabin at the end of the world. Yeah, I mean, totally. Okay. Absolutely. So, you know, you know, the thing is, is you want, I want to be in a place, like, where I got a chance to catch everyone. And, uh, and I, I felt the same way about when I, you know, when I sold to a publisher, when I sold my first book, I sold to William Morrow, and I wanted to work with Jennifer Brell, my editor at William Morrow. And the reason I wanted to work with her is because she worked with Neil Gaiman. And Neil, they, they were, William, William Morrow was publishing Neil Gaiman's books they're all fantasy. They're full of weird ideas and elves and gods and like vampires strolling around and stuff. But like they were never sold to a niche audience. William Morrow never said this is only for people who are in the fantasy cult. These are books for everyone. And I I wanted that too. I wanted, you know, I wanted a chance to make my case to every reader, not just a tiny segment of, you know, the American. Well, this is, this is I mean Horror has suffered some of the same uh, slings and arrows that mysteries have, of course, which is, you know, these are genre books, so we're going to dismiss them because they're right. only genre. They're not real books. Um, you know, there's certainly nobody in this audience who feels that way. Uh, they're, they're reading, uh, Barbara, you could go out of business if that were true, but, you know, it's well, not, I, so. I do think that crime, I do think that crime fiction has always had a strong literary strain that has remained pretty respectable. I mean, like, you know, Laura Lippman is a crime writer, but I think when you look at the books, you kind of feel like that could also be an Oprah pick. Well, but I would argue that Laura <laughs> not, That's not a criticism of Laura Lippman. I wasn't making fun of that at all. Because <laughs> I, think, I think she kicks ass. I'm just saying that the books are presented in a way where it's like, you know, you don't have to be a crime fetishist to think, you know, I might want to try that. Just all you have to Absolutely. be is someone who wants a good story. Right. Well, the, the, I, I would argue that the genre writing in all the genres has changed where it's not about um, just the tropes anymore. My yeah. mystery, mystery readers don't generally read mysteries, I think, for the puzzle. The, 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 uh, the golden age is great. I do love fair play mysteries. Though. I understand. But, you know, they also want character. <coughs> they want the development of the character. They like the characters. Sometimes, sometimes they despise the characters. They want to spend time with them, whether it's uh, whether it's Laura's yes. guess or it's... Uh, uh, in, in another mystery writer, Harry Bosch, or something like that, we're interested in the characters. And so Lovecraft said that great supernatural literature had to be like a hoax. He said it had to be 99% realistic. With yeah. that 1% thread of whatever, the unexpected, the supernatural. And I think, it's the, I think that's still very much true. And that inevitably means that you've got to write about the real world. You've right. got to write about things that are the deep-rooted fears, the deep-seated problems of our society. And so it's inevitable that genre writing, if it's any good, if it's good, is just as good, if you will, as literature, because they're all about the same things. I, I read a review, I, I read a review once of a, 
hit science fiction film where a critic sort of said very sadly, this film is an artistic failure because it's not about anything except itself. And, which I thought was such an enigmatic statement at first, but gradually I kind of picked it apart to, to feel like, you know, we value stories when they ask interesting questions, you know, when they explore interesting ideas. And so, yeah, you want something with, like, you know, lightsabers and spaceships in your science fiction, but you also, if it has no attachment to the life you live, it's never anything more than the lightest form of escapism. Right. Um, you know, and so I've always tried, like when I write stories, stories of the supernatural or the fantastic or horror, I have always tried to have something in there that's about the way we live life now and the problems we actually, you know, we actually might face or might wrestle with in our everyday lives. But one of the things, and I do think that that's, that's one of the things people want from horror fiction. I mean, I always talk about, like, like why? Why do we want to be scared? Why do? You, why would you buy a book to be terrified and not be able to sleep at night? For like, that's so perverse. And and but what I've hit on is there's there's you know you you will never ever be attacked by a vampire. None of us. You're no danger of ever having your life slowly drained away one night at a time by an implacable supernatural enemy. But some people in this room might someday get a cancer diagnosis. And cancer is an invisible enemy that saps your life one day at a time, and you can't wrestle with it. it you know, you, you can't see it. You can't wrestle with it in a straightforward, like a straightforward adversary. And on some unconscious level, we know there are terrible possibilities facing us in the course of our lives. And, and you know, um, thinking about it, all day long is stressful and depressing. But if you can turn to a story, if you can turn to a story about a vampire, you can enter the safe playground of the imagination. And in the safe playground of the imagination, you can actually have fun while you're sort of rehearsing terrible scenarios. And we thrive on that rehearsal. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I wrote a long introduction to one of my anthologies in which I said, why do we have nightmares? And to me, my personal explanation, I'm not a psychologist, is that they're experiments. We're trying out Thought how would we deal with that situation. My nightmare when I was a kid was the big bad wolf chasing you down a dark hallway and I'd get to the end of the light switch and it would not work. And I'd go to flip mm. on the light switch, would of course be the end of the big bad wolf, but the lights wouldn't work. So it was an ex it was how do you deal with that? And I think horror books, stories, ghost stories, all of those are very much the same. They're thought experiments. And the best part about it, you can close the cover. If it's sort of, if you're too upset, you can stop. Put it down. Stories can also offer us, um, they can awful, also offer us the chance to get the justice we're so often denied in life. I wrote a story in the last book, so the last book was called Strange Weather, and there's four short novels in it. And the first one is called Snapshot. And Snapshot is about an elderly woman who is being persecuted by a man known as the Phoenician. And the Phoenician has a Polaroid camera, and every time he sneaks up on her and takes a picture of her, he steals one of her memories. Everyone in the neighborhood believes she's suffering from Alzheimer's. But in fact, she's the prey for this supernatural adversary. And then there's an 11-year-old boy who knows her and cares about her, and he comes to believe her. And he faces off with the Phoenician. And the thing about that story is many of us know someone and care about someone who suffered from dementia or suffers from Alzheimer's. And it sucks. It's terrible. It's t fucking terrible to watch someone go through that. And I think a lot of people would just really like to punch Alzheimer's in the face. And that's not going to happen in real life. But it can happen in a story, and that's better than nothing. Yeah. That can be kind that's of satisfying. Cool. Well, that's nice of you to do that. I mean, there's other <laughs> You know, I, I just read uh, uh, one of Richard Lehman's novels, I forgot which one, and it was like, I kept waiting for it to turn out okay. And it didn't. It did. It. <laughs> it did. And there are writers who do that too. Some well, of them you know very well. So. Sometimes I've, I've actually done that myself, and I've, I've, I mean, I actually literally did it in the story right after Snapshot. I wrote a story called Loaded, which is about um, gun violence in America. And a lot of people are really angry about the way that story works out. 
but I didn't think that I could write a story about every facet of gun violence in America and say, don't worry, we don't have to change everything because it's all going to work out. Mm. <laughs> because it's not working out. I mean, I don't know what the, I don't know what we do, you know, what the plan is. I don't know what we do different. I can just tell you the, the way we're doing things right now, it ain't working out. So, anyway. So, winemakers always say uh, the greatest wine of the decade, the wine, the best wine they've ever made is the wine they're selling right now. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about this book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the greatest book you can get right now. Did you ever? <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'm not going to argue with you. It's true. So this is a collection of uh, used material and very used, used, used soil, threadbare material. And really, yeah, the, the, the last dregs I could scrape off the floor of my career. <laughs> Filed together for you. So buy this one because there won't be any more. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> no, so, yeah, so full throttle, like, so, so, the thing about a book of short stories is, in some ways, I have almost more of an emotional attachment to a collection. Full throttle is a collection of 13 stories written over the last 10 years, and to me, each one of those stories is sort of a bookmark to a time in my life. You know, um, I, I look at it and I can say, well, here's the story that I wrote during the week. I was in the United Kingdom riding British Rail. I wrote a whole. I wrote this story, Wolverton Station, longhand, on exclusively on British trains because that's where I had the idea, and it was about a guy on a train. Um, you know, I look at another one and I'm like, here's the story that my dad and I came up with together when we were sitting over pancakes at Colonial House of Pancakes at like 10 a.m. Uh, 10 p.m. Um, you know, we had to have a late night flapjack run, and uh, um, you know, and like that's another that's another good memory, as you do, right? Um, uh, you know, so so each of the stories um, sort of are a marker for me, and in, in in a weird way, it's kind of almost like a memoir of daydreams, you know, over pretty dark daydreams, I guess. Um, there are a couple. There are, uh, the story had the book has two new stories in it. One is called Late Returns which is about uh, a guy in grief, he's lost his parents, and he's lost his job as well as a trucker, long haul trucker, and uh, he winds up driving uh, the bookmobile for his town's library, and he's been driving the bookmobile for a couple weeks when he finds himself uh, delivering books to dead people, um, and accepting books that they forgot, books that they weren't able to return because they died. Um, and then I wrote another story called Moms, um, which is about America's national crop, which isn't wheat or corn, it's paranoia. Um, it's set on a uh, on the compound of a survivalist, a white nationalist, um, with Timothy McVeigh-like sympathies. And his son, who's about 13, is beginning to think maybe dad's not okay after all. Um, is beginning to wrestle with some. But that story is also about mums. Is, uh, that's, so it's got this one thread, which is about the Patriot Movement, it's got another thread, which is about this kid loses his mother, and so he grows a new one, also as you do. So there's a couple stories that I wrote with my dad in there. Um, there's one called Throttle, um, which we wrote to honor Richard Matheson. There's another called In the Tall Grass, which Woo! is uh, going to be a feature film on Netflix, Smart. available in four and a half hours. Four and a half hours. <laughs> four and a half hours. <laughs> In the Tall Grass is a great one to watch when you're at home alone in the late evening. It's very relaxing. It's very chill. It is Netflix and chill time. Um, so, uh, so that's cool. There's another story in there. Uh, there's another story in Full Throttle called By the Silver Water of Lake Champlain, um, which sort of addresses my lifelong, and I do mean lifelong, uh, fixation on lake monsters. Literally, my first childhood memories are about going to Loch Ness um, when my my parents my parents split uh, not each other they my parents my parents split America after Ford pardoned Nixon. Do I got that right? It, uh, it, they were so pissed off by it they they decided fuck this country we're out of here. They moved to the United Kingdom um, and um, and while they were there, so that's my earliest memories. I was about six. Uh, my dad, uh, while they were there, my dad collaborated with Peter Straub on several cases of beer. 
Uh, and, uh, and my mom, and my mom, I was fixated on Nessie, and so my mom, um, my mom took us north to Edinburgh to go see Loch Ness. I had begged and badgered and nagged, and finally she said, "Okay, we're going." So she took my sister, my, me, and uh, my brother Owen, who at the time was a baby. He was about nine months old, ten months old, and we drove part of the way to Loch Ness and then the roads flooded out. It was torrential rains, they were completely washed out, so we never got there. And we drove, we, we drove back to the train station. My mom returned the rental car, we got on the train. She's sitting on the train, as the train pulls out, it suddenly hits her. She had to change my brother's diaper <laughs> in the car on the trip. And she wadded it up and she stuck it under the passenger seat. <laughs> and she forgot to she forgot to get it. And that's why they moved back to America. And, and, and that's why they moved back to America. <laughs> years later, I called her off. Years later I was in Edinburgh and I'm like, Mom, you know what just happened to me? I went into Hertz to rent a car. And you know what they said? They said, We remember what you did the last one. <laughs> And there's no way. The, um, but, no, so so by the silver waters of Lake Champlain is about some little kids who discover the washed up corpse of a plesiosaur on Lake Champlain, and um, it's got kind of a little bit of a Ray Bradbury feel to it. And that one has been filmed as an episode of Creep Show on Ooh. Shutter, which is a streaming horror network, um, and that's also out in in the next few weeks. So there's a lot of interesting sort of the, you know, the, the collection has a lot of sort of facets going on to it. There's an audio book. The audio book has got a, you know, great set of readers on it. Neil Gaiman read Wolverton Station, which is a story set in England. Zachary Quinto, who plays Charlie Manx in the TV show Nosferatu, who re he read one called Fawn. Um, Ashley, Ashley Cummings, um, uh, who plays Vic, read one of the stories she read, All I Care About Is You. Um, uh, Two of the stars, two of the stars from Lock and Key, the Netflix version of Lock and Key, which will be out next year, read stories, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Well, let's give the audience something that they won't get on the audiobook, which is Joe Hill reading some of the story. You'll get that too. I read, I read one of the stories. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> forget it, forget it. I'll get no, no, I'll go ahead and read. If, if you guys want to have like a sort of like a, a a flavor of one of the stories, I'll read you a little piece from Dark Carousel which is the second story. So, let me see, oops, I just lost a bunch of your stuff. Hang on a second, I'll find it. Okay, so Dark Carousel is set about 1994. It's about four teenagers who go to um, a beachside, a rundown beachside amusement park, and it's sort of their last stab before adulthood. They're all out of high school. They're all headed off in their different directions. One of them's getting ready to go to the Marines. Two of them are going off to college. One of them staying home to look after her mother. And, uh, but they're out to have a night of fun at the very end of the summer. And they walk out to this carousel. I think the carousel, I, kind of, I think the carousel is called the Wheel of Fear. Because um, it's the fastest running carousel in America. Um, but so they've walked out to look at it late in the night. And uh, I'll read from that bit. Okay. Um, the Wurlitzer began to play a theatrical, whimsical, but also curiously dirge-like melody. Wandering amid the steeds, I looked at the creatures of the wheel with a mix of fascination and repulsion. It seemed to me a uniquely disquieting collection of grotesqueries. There was a wolf as big as a bicycle, its sculpted glossy fur a tangled mess of blacks and grays, and its eyes as yellow as my beer. One paw was lifted slightly, and its pad was crimson, as if he had trod in blood. A sea serpent uncoiled itself across the outer edge of the carousel, a scaly rope as thick as a tree trunk. It had a shaggy gold mane and a gaping red mouth lined with black fangs. When I leaned in close, I discovered they were real, a mismatched set of shark's teeth, black with age. When I walked through a team of white horses, frozen in the act of lunging, tendons straining in their necks, their mouths open as if to scream in anguish or rage. White horses with white eyes, like classical statuary. Where the hell you think they got these horses from? Satan circus supplies? Look it, Jake said, 
and he gestured at the mouth of one of the horses. It had the black forked tongue of a snake lolling out of, it, lolling out of its mouth. They come from Nagadoches, Texas, came a voice from down on the pier. They are over a century old. They were salvaged from Cougar's carousel of 10,000 lights after a fire burned Cougar's fun park to the ground. You can see how that one there was scorched. The ride operator stood at a control board to one side of the steps leading up to the merry-go-round. He wore a dress uniform as if he were an ancient bellboy in some grand Eastern Europe European hotel, a place where aristocrats went to summer with their families. His suit jacket was of green velvet with two rows of brass buttons down the front and golden epaulets on his shoulders. He put down a steel thermos and pointed at a horse whose face was blistered on one side, toasted a golden brown like a marshmallow. The operator's upper lip lifted in a curiously ugly grin. He had red, plump, vaguely indecent lips like a young Mick Jagger, unsettling <laughs> such an old, shriveled face. They screamed. Who? I asked. The horses, he said, when the carousel began to burn. A dozen witnesses heard them. They screamed like girls. <laughs> <laughs> kids come to regret ever riding on the wheel, but you kind of already guessed that. <laughs> so, uh, after we all buy this book, mm. who should we be reading? Who, who are you reading that... Uh, I, I'd be sure to pick up uh, Lee Bardugo's Ninth House, which is out in about nine days, and um, it's like it's like dirty adult Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> it's set in Yale and theorizes that the secret societies at Yale all have access to spell books and magical abilities. The lead character is one of the best heroines I've read um, all year, a woman named Alex who's a reformed junkie and has a magical gift of her own. And she almost has to operate as like, uh, like she's like policing these various secret societies. That's what she's been brought to Yale to do. Um, and so that's a tremendous one. I'm reading a thriller called The Institute right now with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. The name of the author eludes me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it somewhere. But I, mean, uh, I, um, 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 whoever he is, whoever he is, is good. And, I mean, he shows a lot of skill. He should keep, he should keep at it, for sure. <laughs> I look forward to the next one. <laughs> well, did I ask uh, enough dumb questions and now you'd like your turn? Yes. I'm going to interrupt for a minute because Leslie has been kind enough to come over here and visit with us this evening, and I think we should have a few minutes from him. That's okay. Absolutely. Leslie is um, the multi-award winning Edgar Anthony Award, all sorts of things, um, anthologist, and his range of subject matter is extraordinary. Frankenstein, Dracula, Lovecraft, ghost stories, just won an Edgar for a collection of five early American classics. He is the editor of the Haunted Library series, and he is going, he's the editor of the Library of Congress Crime, Crime Classics series, which inaugurates next April. So what I want to know is, how can you practice law when all you're doing is footnoting? <laughs> and how did you ever decide that you wanted to be an anthologist? I mean, uh, sorry, uh, an annotator, or whatever I do. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say that you haven't read Dracula until you've read Leslie's annotated Dracula. Thank you. Uh, which is like, yeah, which is it, it just like it's like uh, you know, it's like seeing through the page to six different levels beneath it. You get to see all the architecture. It, it's really been fun. Uh, so I. I I love this stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geek. Uh, I love comics, uh, which is why I annotated Sandman and Watchmen. Um, I love, and those are those are not here tonight, but uh, you can find them on my webpage, lesliesklinger.com. Um, and um, you know, I started this started out for me as being a Sherlock Holmes nut uh, and wanting to be like that fellow William S. Baring Gould who wrote the Antitude of Sherlock Holmes in the 1960s mm. and um, sort of thought, gee, maybe I could do that and then um, I did and uh, and then when I finished that it was like well, uh, this was really great being a writer 
I really enjoyed it, and could I do more? And my wife said Dracula, and, and that was next, and then there was one after that, and one after that. Um, and so the annotated books to me, Barbara, they're not, I mean, I always say these books don't need less clinger to be great books. They are fantastic books. They are books with large audiences, whether it's Lovecraft or uh, Sherlock Holmes or Sandman or whatever. Uh, I try to make the reader's experience a little more enjoyable, a little better. Um, I'm looking for footnotes that are like, wow, that's cool. Or that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, and most of these books are books that are from remote times. So we need to understand why does, why does Lucy and her mother go visit somebody and leave a visiting card in Dracula? What's a visiting mm -hmm. card? You know, those mm -hmm. are things that we, we don't understand anymore. Uh, so there's historical context, there's uh, careful analysis of the text in many cases, um, and Sherlockians love to play the game of these stories probably have, like Lovecraft said, a large element of truth to them. So can we check it out and sort of see what works? Dracula was a lot of fun because I came up with this really crackpot idea that why are, there's a lot of disparities in the book. There's a lot of sort of odd things in the book. And I came up with the idea that um, Stoker had been asked, he says in the beginning, I've been asked to assemble these papers. He got them all from Jonathan Harker and Mina Harker. And um, he's put them together. But there's some things that are clearly wrong in the, in the book. And why are they wrong? And I suggested that Dracula himself had survived and had come back and basically forced Stoker to suppress certain truths. Hmm. But anyway, it was a little weird. But anyway. well, well, I would also say, so, so Dracula is uh, epistolary. It's told from multiple points of view. And uh, as you know, I, everyone who's watched Law and Order knows eyewitnesses are terrible. You know, um, they'll right. say, yeah, they'll say, uh, you know, the guy who shot him had, uh, you know, um, black boots on and, and red hair. And they, when they catch the guy, it turns out he has red boots and black hair. Um, you know, so the idea that doesn't all the facts don't quite match up actually makes it strangely more feel more truthful. Absolutely. Um, we got to nerd out for a couple seconds. I got a couple quick questions I got I, I to gotta ask you. Um, so first of all, are you a Baker Street Irregular? Yes. You are a Baker Street Irregular. I've only, I only know one other actual Baker Street Irregular. How'd you get into the club? Uh, it's like a secret club. I well, think, I, honestly, no, honestly, they, they say this is not true, but I believe that they have a, a private smoking lounge in New York City and in London, and you can only enter if you know what bookcase to move. So there's like, like and I'm convinced they meet. Well, if I told you the answers to those questions. <laughs> right. right, right. No, the Baker Street Irregulars is uh, now 85 years old, it's a literary society. It is, membership is by invitation only. Um, you basically get to be invited if you're um, a clubbable person, that's kind of a good description, so, somebody that the rest of us would like to hang around with, and you're sincerely interested in Sherlock Holmes. It's not a, it's not an award. Right. Um, there are 300 irregulars around the world. Um, there are, I think, half a dozen in Southern California, uh, maybe one or two here in Arizona. Um, so, but it's, it's a good group. You should come to the dinner. I will arrange that. Well, that would be awesome. So, that would be awesome. So, so as someone who's annotated the Sherlock Holmes stories, can you explain to me whether John Watson was shot his right shoulder, his left shoulder, or his Absolutely. right knee? Absolutely. Where the hell was he shot? Because because I read the stories multiple times. I've read read my way through. I have a whole yes. history with Sherlock Holmes. And, and even as a kid, I noticed that the bullet had a tendency to drift around John's body. Well, so that's, that's right. In some of the stories, Watson's wound seems to be in his shoulder, and others, it's in his leg. Now, there are many theories about why this is why this happened. Um, one of my favorites is that Watson was bending over, uh, taking care of certain business, and the bullet penetrated both at once. That's one theory. There's another theory about the bullet traveling down the subclavian artery through the body and passing it. Through. That one's a little hard to believe. Lori King had a wonderful uh, a suggestion. Um, he's shot by a Jezail bullet. Now, Jezail bullet, there's no such thing as a Jezail bullet. A Jezail rifle is a long gun, and the uh, the Afghan uh, tribesmen who used them 
they're homemade bullets. They they mm. make their own. Oh, bullets. so maybe it, maybe it broke apart. Exactly. Mm. That's her suggestion. Is that the bullet actually split and hit Watson in two places at once? So there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. And and then and then I'm 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 thinking about it. I'm thinking if I trying to decide whether I accept that or not. I mean, is there any possibility he got shot in the shoulder, hung out, had some adventures with Sherlock Holmes, and then re-enlisted, and went sure. back, got shot again? Sure. Okay. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> is, there anything, is there anything you haven't had a chance to annotate that you really wish you could? Uh, well, uh, yes. There's <laughs> there's two, two two answers to that. One answer is this fellow. Um, I have this feeling it's connected with the the thing you that book you mentioned. The institute. Yeah. And I have been talking about doing an annotated the stand. Oh, um, oh, yeah. We're That's trying cool. to make that happen. Um, American Gods, by the way, that you also alluded to, Annotated American Gods comes out in March from Robert Collins, uh, and uh, that will be Can't lovely. Wait. You know, part of the problem is the publishers want books that are going to sell really well. They right. don't like books that just sort of sit there and look good. Um, so we've talked about lots of them. Uh, there's nothing in the pipeline at the moment. People ask me, am I going to do Jekyll and Hyde or this and that? You know. I'd love to. What about Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? It'd be great. I actually pitched Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling <laughs> I think said that would she'd be like to do it herself. She said she wanted to do it herself. Tolkien's people, Will she ever, though? <laughs> Tolkien's people said to me, he left strict instructions, he didn't want it done, and until we can get a hold of him again... <laughs> right. That's what they said. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have these great ideas, and then I have to sort of get the rights, but yeah. find somebody that's willing to do it. I'm sort of running out of major public domain material, to <laughs> uh, which is why we're doing these other series, because now I can annotate lightly these other public domain works. Uh, what Barbara was alluding to, the Library of Congress Crime Classics, um, is going to be a very exciting series. It's American mysteries that are largely sort of out of print. Um, the first one is That Affair Next Door by Anna Catherine Green, uh, which is the first Amelia Butterworth mystery, 1897. The second one is The Rat Began to Gnaw the Rope by C.W. Grafton, the father of Sue Grafton, uh, really? an award-winning, hard-boiled, funny detective novel. Really? The, the third one is Case Pending by Del Shannon. Uh, which is one of the very first police procedural novels set in L.A. Luis Mendoza. Detective Didn't. Luis Mendoza. Uh, yeah. and so I get to do some annotating there, too. Not heavy annotations. but uh, So I, I try and keep busy. And then there's anthologies. And I love doing these anthologies. I've been doing what I call uh, dead people anthologies, which the one Barbara mentioned, Ghost Stories, uh, is a collection of classic ghost stories. Um, many from writers you probably f didn't even know wrote ghost stories, like Mark Twain and right. people like that. Uh, and they're all they're all dead writers. They're all dead writers. They're all dead writers. Be in that they're all dead writers. <laughs> uh, and uh, by the way, Lisa Morton and I just turned in our next one, which is called Weird Women, which is uh, women's horror writing from the 19th century. Oh, that's great. Um, and uh, that'll be out in January, I think. Um, and then there's the Living People anthologies, <laughs> which is, uh, Lori King and I have done four uh, uh, collections of stories inspired by the Sherlock Holmes canon, uh, including stories by Michael Conley, Sarah Provensky, Jeff Deaver, Lee Child, Neil Gaiman, Was Harlan study Ellison, an emerald? Was Study an Emerald by Neil in one of your collections? No, he wrote, I thought he was going to write a sequel to it. He wrote a, a story called A Case of Death and Honey, which was nominated for the Edgar. Wow. And uh, a brilliant story about Holmes in his old age involved with honey and bees. Oh, and, sure. Uh, oh, that's great. Wonderful story. Uh, and we're hoping that maybe somebody else will write a story. So we're hoping we're putting together a fifth volume that will hopefully come out in a year and a half. So I've had a brilliant idea, yeah. which is that he'd like to be a Baker Street irregular and he'd like yeah. Sherlock Holmes. And you need an author to contribute to your next. So maybe that would be the price of getting <laughs> getting my membership, being told which book to pull, which book to pull to enter the I secret study. No, no. Actually, <laughs> you need to write a Sherlock Holmes story for the anthology. Well, this is a good segue to talk about that Joe is already writing. Yeah, I love, I mean, I love fair play mysteries. I mean, I've got all these comics projects coming, but one of the things is, like, I'm, basically I never matured past about 12 years old, right? <laughs> you know? And, and uh, so I, with IDW, I'm writing a, a new series 
the first first collection in the series is called Dying is Easy. It's the first adventure of uh, my detective, Shit Talk Holmes, the insulting detective. <laughs> <laughs> Shit Talk, Shit Talk, his, his, his full name is Sid Faulkner Holmes. He's a former homicide detective who left under an ethical cloud. And so he's returned to his first love, which is trying to be a stand-up comedian. <laughs> and, uh, and it starts one night in the comedy club. And, uh, and the whole thing is constructed as a fair play mystery because like, I love Anthony Horowitz. And I love Foyle's War, you know. And I, I, you know, I, I have near, you know, religious feelings about that series. And so I really do. When I read a mystery, I want to have a chance to solve it. And I think it's important to play fair with the reader, um, at least in some. In some there's room for all kinds of crime stories. But I, I do like when it's all there. And if if you're smarter than me, you'll spot everything and solve it before my detective will. You know, but then my goal is to sort of like give it to you, but then, you know, misdirect you away from it and, uh, um, you know, keep you guessing until the end. So, and th I think with Dying is Easy, so that's coming out, the first issue comes out in December, and I've finished it, I've written, written the whole thing, it's going to be a five issue series. I think our hope is actually to keep it going and that we'll bring in some other writers who will do, like one writer will do another mystery and then another writer will do another mystery and then I'll come back in and do the fourth shit talk. The Adventures of Shit Talk Home. Memoirs of shit up. Exactly. Right, exactly, yeah. totally. Okay. All right. So we don't have a plan for doing We do. I do. We, are we gonna? Are people gonna have questions? Yes, I'm just gonna questions? say enough yeah. dumb questions by me. Yes. Well, it's your turn to ask dumb questions. We have so. goodies. If you're, Did you ask, you ask the a good questions question. are really good. <laughs> uh, you, sir. What was your involvement? Uh, with your your first-hand involvement with Walking the Keys, the television show. What was my first-hand involvement with Lock and Key, the television so, show? So Lock and Key has had this sort of fascinating journey to TV where it was filmed, they filmed a pilot for Fox in 2010, um, but it didn't get off the ground. It was pretty It was pretty good. It was directed by Mark Romanek. It was, the script was written by Joshua Friedman, who uh, was the showrunner for the Sarah Connor Chronicles. It was very chilly and very scary, and, and Fox passed on it and went with Alcatraz instead. You guys, Alcatraz had like ten seasons, right? It was huge. <laughs> the, um, the, then it was filmed. Then it was filmed. I wrote a script for uh, a, a first episode. Actually, I wound up writing three episodes for a Hulu, a projected Hulu t TV series, and we filmed that pilot. Um, and it was Andy Muccietti who directed it. Directed the pilot. It came out great. It was really scary. It looked awesome. Um, in the mid, in the midst of making the show, Hulu had corporate turnover. A new guy came in um, from Fox Sports, and basically he just wanted to wipe the slate. He just wanted to start everything fresh, and so they shit canned it. Um, we were saved, though. We were saved, and, and, and Netflix swooped in and has filmed ten episodes. I've, I've already seen all ten episodes. It's like TV crack. Um, <laughs> it is really good. It's so much fun. Um, and and I, I was pretty closely involved with it in the sense of, um, you know, I co-wrote the first episode. Um, and then, and then stuff the ideas that we developed for the really for the Hulu edition um, is shot throughout, you know, sprinkled throughout that first season, and you know, and the, but we also took it in a different direction uh, per Netflix's request. So, um, I definitely think you know the third, in this case, the third time is the charm that it really worked out um, uh, the way we, we always hoped it would. Hey, there you go, prize. Yes, you. Me? Yes. Okay. What is your most interesting writing? Thank you. What is my most interesting writing quirk? Um, this is not of the crap in your pants. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I mean, I don't know that I have any all that interesting, um, really any interesting quirks. I write the first drafts longhand um, because I learn. I learn, so I have a very, you know, uh, you. one of the things that slows writers down is that voice of criticism in their head. And so, you know, because you're writing and you got this voice saying, ah, she wouldn't say that, or, oh, that's stupid. And it's like, you know, it, it, it's, that's, it's self-doubt that can cripple you. But when you're writing longhand, it turns out cognitively that that critical inner voice focuses on the quality of your handwriting and stops critiquing the story. And so you can actually write very loose and free and, and be very relaxed. Um, um, because you've managed to shut, you managed to trick the critical voice into shutting up. So I guess that's my quirk, but it's not that quirky. A lot of writers do the first draft longhand. Okay, thank you. 
Yes, sir. Red Hat. Oh, okay. Um, which author do you think has had the biggest influence on you that you're not related to? <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that. Which writer, which writer do I think has had the biggest impact on me that I'm not related to? I'm glad you said that because it's like, it really is kind of hard to get around my parents. I mean, like, you know, um, I read all their stories when I was growing up. And, and, you know, all the dinnertime conversation was about books, characters, you know, publishing, what we were reading. Um, and, you know, it was like a different era. It was like it sounds so Victorian, but like after dinner, you know, we used to go into the living room where we'd pass a book around and read out loud. Um, because there wasn't like an internet and there wasn't like much on TV and it just seemed like a fun thing to pass an evening. So it's sort of hard to get around how immensely I'm influenced by my parents, both as writers and just their example as people. Um, I, I learned a lot from reading the novels of short stories of Bernard Malibin. Um, the first story that I I, 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 I mentioned that I spent all this time trying to write New Yorker stories that wasn't very successful, but I love Bernard Malibin, and at some point I came across an essay by him called Why Fantasy? And in Why Fantasy, Malmud said, basically, um, Philip Roth's New Jersey doesn't really exist. It's a completely imaginary construct that only exists in Philip Roth's mind and the mind of his readers. It's as improbable and as uh, imaginary a place as Alice's Wonderland. And once you recognize that, once you recognize that all fiction is fantasy fiction, um, it's all daydreams, it's all invention. Once you realize that, you can give yourself permission to write about ghosts, or devils, or angels, or zombies, um, and that each of those, you know, those, those fantastic improbabilities um, can have great sim symbolic power, and great narrative power, and there's no point in leaving those interesting tools in the toolbox. And that gave me permission to start writing the kind of stories I wanted to write, which were stories of fantasy and horror and science fiction, I wrote a story called Pop Art, not long after reading the essay. Pop Art uh, is, is, someone likes it. Uh, <laughs> Pop, Art, Pop Art is the story of uh, the friendship between a juvenile delinquent and an inflatable boy named Arthur Roth. Art is made of plastic and filled with air. He weighs 12 ounces, and if he sat in a sharpened pencil, it would kill him. Um, and I had so much fun writing that story, which is loosely modeled on a story of Malmitz called The Jew Bird. And, um, and it sold very quickly, and and people really seemed to respond to it. And it was like, finally things clicked. So I guess I would say probably Bernard Malman. The other writer I would mention that I feel very strongly about and who is sort of like, I sometimes feel has taken an active hand in my career would be Neil Gaiman, um, who's been a terrific friend to me and something of a mentor. And as occasionally when I... Uh, all right, this is a segue, and I'm, we should be getting more questions in. I gotta, I gotta have a quick segue. Uh, no, I'd say... I love Doctor Who. Love, love, love Doctor Who. Uh, I love the Tenth Doctor, the David Tennant years, and I'm such a Doctor Who geek that I have a TARDIS in my house. Um, there's a big blue phone box coming projecting out of one wall, and when you open it, you come into my library. Um, so it's bigger on the inside. Um, um, I I wanted to write for Doctor Who so badly. And my agent got me a chance to pitch on it. And I worked up three, I worked so hard, I came up with three of my absolute best pitches. And strangely, um, I wound up, uh, I wound up, um, I was in Florida and Neil Gaiman came over to visit and spent a night at the house and he read all my Doctor Who pitches and talked about what worked and what didn't and made suggestions. He basically edited my Doctor Who pitches. Um, so when I say Neil's been a big influence, I mean, he's been really um, an incredible friend and an advisor. The coda to this story, however, is I sent my pitches in, and the producer with Doctor Who replied that they had never let an American write the show, and if they were going to, they wouldn't start with me. <laughs>
Is that based on the Matt Ruff novel? Yes. I think yeah. it is, yes. And uh, do you think that it's possible that we might actually start seeing some no. of his works? No, I don't. <laughs> or is it still <laughs> unfilmable? I think, I, go ahead, Joe. For, for a countering viewpoint, no, I don't think so either. <laughs> I, I think Lovecraft is unfilmable, uh, just in, ge in general. And second, I know, having had this conversation with Guillermo del Toro, that the conversation went something like this. So, we love that novel, At the Mountains of Madness. We really want to make a great film. Let's talk about the female lead. <laughs> oh, there is no female lead. Oh, well, let's talk about a different film. So, yeah. It's never going to happen. Uh, it, you know, Lovecraft is not only is the his stories deliberately unfilmable. It's about the unnameable. You can't show what a showboat looks like and have the story work. Um, and second, really, I mean, Hollywood is just not interested in films about women. So yeah, well, that's right. I mean, you know, uh, Lovecraft was terrified of women, um, and. People, you know, brown skinned people and, you know, foreigners, and, you know, and dogs. Now, that's not to say that there aren't <laughs> no, some. That doesn't mention, mean. You that mentioned mean. one of the great Lovecraft films, which is The Thing. I think that's probably the greatest Lovecraft film. It's ever pretty made. good. Hey, look, Reanimator was good. Yeah. <laughs> I love Reanimator. Yeah, well, <laughs> different tastes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> John, John Carpenter's The Thing is clearly so based on Lovecraft. And I. I think that the, I think that Lovecraft did have some astonishing ideas. I believe that he was mentally ill and that he had a terror of almost everything. That he was, you know, like terrified to like leave his house. Um, he was a terrible writer. Um, you know, um, he had, but he had a vision of horror that did have. I mean, on a sentence by sentence level, I think he was he was just a ghastly writer. Um, you know, but but the ideas have had staying power, I think what makes him especially unfilmable is, um, you know, that he refused to really show the monsters because they had to be so terrifying that to see them you would go insane. And of course anything we put on film is not going to make us insane. We're going to have a, we might be like, oh, or we might laugh, you know, but we're certainly not going to, you know, that there will be no possibility of that happening. I, I also think, I also think, you know, that that saying it was just so scary it would make you crazy to see it is a little bit of a cop out. You know, today, I, I today, kind of want to. Today it is. Yeah, I kind of want to. You know, I feel like when you know when we, pull, I want to pull the monster out from under the bed and see what it looks like. Um, so. Um, so there you have it. Yeah. Uh, and when the new film comes out next year, yeah. <laughs> actually Nicholas Nicholas Cage just did. Uh, a look at uh, did uh, the color out of space, and I heard it was pretty good. So. Well, so well, there you go. And, and Nicholas we Cage actually seems like someone who might have seen a Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, like that actually. He it was uh, super uh, right, yeah. <laughs> boy standing, way in the back there. Yes, sir. Do you have a favorite inscape? Do I have a favorite inscape? Um, you'll have to come up here to get your key ring. <laughs> the um. Uh, Nosferatu postulates that um, that people have that people live in two worlds. They live in the real world, and they also live in the world of their imagination, and that both places are equally real. And um, um, there are some people who are so there are some people powerful creatives who can puncture the fabric between the world of thought and the real world. One of them is Charlie Manx, and he has this imaginary world called Christmas Land. It's this sort of hideous amusement park that he can bring children to. And uh, there's another, he, he, Charlie is opposed by Vic McQueen, who has an inscape, the Shorter Way Bridge, that she can visit to almost like teleport between vast distances. Um, the, the question is, do I have a favorite inscape, though, which is almost sort of very, that's almost a difficult question to tackle, um, because it's almost like you're really asking me, like, you know, what's my favorite imaginary world? And um, and that's that's a tough one, I don't know. I was thinking about why we love shared universes um, a couple days ago though, and I was thinking like, because everyone loves like the Marvel movies, they're all interconnected, and I think people kind of are turned on by the idea that my dad's stories are all exist in an interconnected world, and that part of what started to work in Stephen King films and TV shows 
is that the filmmakers are acknowledging that and kind of throwing those connections out there and the people dig it. And I was thinking, wondering, why do we care? Why can't a story just stand alone? Why do they, why do we want those interconnections? And it hit me that we all carry shared universes around in our heads. You know, like, like in my head, I've got Aslan from Narnia crammed right up against Spider-Man, crammed right up against Jack Torrance, crammed right up against all, they're all living in the same, you know, same small cubic space inside my head where there's no barriers between universes and no copyright control and, you know, Sony doesn't have to negotiate with Disney to put Spider-Man next to Iron Man. You know, and and um, and I think that's why we we want we want the stories to meet for some reason. I don't know why, but we just because that's how it is in our heads. I think part of it also is we want more. We want more. We always we, want more. Exactly. We love the story about X, about whatever it is, Jack Torrance, whatever, and we want more. That's why we, we like your more. annotated editions. It's exactly. true, though. That's why we like the annotated editions. And actually, I was thinking, you just can't do it almost in any other form. Although, I guess you could do an annotated, like you could annotate the Beatles albums and like almost go through line by line and talk about what's in sure. the lyrics. Sure. That would be sort of interesting. But it's it's why there's this huge volume of what we call pastiche, Sherlockian right. pastiche. Of more stories about Sherlock Holmes. We want more. We loved your books. We loved this person's books. We want more. And the way we get it sometimes is the shared universe. Well, and it also goes to this idea that all fiction is fan fiction. You know, that like, like you may be, you know, Michael Chabon has talked about this. You know, when you sit down to write a you may be writing your own. When I write, when I write Shit Talk Holmes, okay, he's my own character, my own invention. And it, but I, I really wanted to write an episode of Foil's War. You it's know, and no one is going to hire me to write an episode of Foil's War, so I just had to make my own shit up. You know, <laughs> but like, it does, it does work. Like, a, hopefully, if I did my job right, it plays like one of Anthony Horowitz's mysteries. It's fan fiction. They're always fan fiction. It's not just me, it's other writers too. Because we're fans. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why. Okay, we need to wrap this up because otherwise we'll be here till midnight. Um, and take the question from over here, Barbara. It's okay. All right. You. Um, With the flower in your hair. Uh, yes. <laughs> Wondering if any of your characters are based off of uh, people that you know. Are any of my characters based off people that I know? Um, Are any of them not based on people? <laughs> <laughs> Are any of them based off You know, like when I, when I, like I, I tend to work from an opposite point of view, which is I want to write about people I don't know, and then I want to get to know them over the next 300 pages, um, or 30 pages, or however long it is. So like when I wrote Judas Coin, in Heart Shake Box, we had this heavy metal musician who's had a career that lasted four decades, and he's had platinum albums and music videos and played arenas. But he's also this real son of a bitch, you know? He's like, he's cool to people who love him, and he's lonely, and he's, you know, banging around by himself up in this, his little private, you know, compound in upstate New York. And I'm just really curious about him. I'm like, how do you wind up like this? How'd this guy get so, who is he? And, you know, what's his deal? And it took me about 300 pages to find out. It wasn't based on anyone I knew. It was just, he just came to visit me, that's all. I see you holding your hand up. I'm going to assume that's partially because... Oh, I don't, this is not a key ring I can give away. It was a key ring. Let's go to the key to your heart. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give it one, but I don't have any left. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Quick question. Did yeah. you switch 
switching gears a little bit, did you ad lib any of your dialogue when you filmed Creep Show, or did you stick to script? <laughs> I was only eight years old, and I just stuck to the I just stuck to the script. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we really do have to wrap it up. Uh, you guys, again, were, you guys were tremendous. Here. Thank you so much. audience also for watching and remind you that you can share that. Um, this